to whoever's watching this, whatever you do that that brings your heart to life, we <clears throat> we we need you. The world needs you to to write your book, to dance your dance, to sing your song, to uh, to build your business, to 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 draw, to paint. To, to teach. Uh, we need you to do what brings your heart alive. And as we we get to see and experience that, uh, we as a body of people become more whole. And so will you, will you please take this seriously? And um, <clears throat> we, we need you. The world needs you. I need you. Um, I need you to live your life and, and I'll live mine. <music>
and your your gifts are just connected to one another. Um, about two weeks ago, I was listening to an interview that was done with Jerry Seinfeld. I've loved Jerry Seinfeld for the last 20 years, and I I, I love the show, but I love his stand-up routine. But more than any of that, I've, I just find him really interesting. And so I was listening to this interview, and the guy who interviewed Jerry Seinfeld, his name is Larry Wild. Um, Larry asks Jerry at the beginning, he said, so Jerry, can you identify the point in time in your life where you knew that you wanted to be a comedian? And Jerry very quickly said, yeah, um, I was I was about eight years old and I was sitting on my stoop with my best friend and we were eating milk and cookies and I said something really funny and my friend laughed and then he spit his milk and his cookies all over my face and all into my hair and all over my clothes. And I thought to myself in that moment, I want to do this professionally. If you listen to the interview, you'll hear more about this. But, but then he went on to say that at that point in time, being a comedian wasn't something that was an option that you do as a profession. He said that he would have times where he wouldn't have a night off for 18 months and he didn't get a paid a penny to do this. He would go from nightclub to nightclub and night to nightclub doing the same 20 minute routine. And he would usually do it twice a night. And he would do that every single night, 18 months in a row without taking one night off and didn't get a pay, paid a penny to do that. But he said, I, the reason why I've become so successful is because I, I wasn't thinking about money. I wasn't thinking about a career. I mean, that really wasn't even a thing at the time. I just knew that what I loved more than anything in the world was making people laugh. And all I wanted to do was to be on a stage making people laugh. And that's how and why he became so successful because he wasn't looking to the, the long-term outcome. He just knew what he desired. And as he followed that desire, he realized that he was very gifted at it. And that's what he has spent his entire career doing. There's a, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs It's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. <clears throat> and that verse says, a man's gifts will make room for him. Another translation of that verse is a man's gifts will bring him before great men or bring him before kings. Um, and what the verse means is that when you, when you discover your gift, the gift that it says in scripture that God knew you before the foundations of the earth were laid. And it says at another point in time that God knit you together in your mother's womb. He, he very intimately knit you together. When God created you, God knew you and he gave you a gift or gifts. And he, he gave you a gift that will lead you into your calling and into your purpose in life. And when, when you, move into that gift, what that verse means in Proverbs is that as you step into your gift, that the world will open up to you. Um, a man's gifts will make room for him. The, the world will open and make room and make space for you to live out of the fullness of the gift that you've been given. Um, when I was 10 years old, the movie Chariots of Fire came out in, in the movie theater. And I, I fell asleep in the first 10 minutes of the movie. It's not a great movie for a 10 year old because um, it's pretty, pretty slow and pretty boring, but it's a really, it's a really good film. But the, the movie is about this guy named, his name is Eric Little. And Eric was, um, Eric was a Christian man, but Eric was also a runner and he, it's a true story. And er, Eric was going to run in the Olympics and his sister was very, uh, very disappointed by this idea because her idea of like what a godly man and her brother would mean would be that he would go and he would be a missionary to China. But Eric loved to run. So there's the scene in the movie where his sister and Eric were talking and Eric said to his sister, he said, he said, Hey, I, I am going to go to China and be a missionary. And she got this huge smile across her face. And then, and then he said, but first I'm going to run. And her, her smile very quickly disappeared. And then, and then he said to her, he said, he said, 
I want to be a missionary, but, but God also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Like I have to run. And my question to you at the beginning and my question to you at the end of this today is where do you feel God's pleasure? And that is deeply connected to your desire and to your gifts. And, and so that's where we're going to begin to go today. Um, when I look back at my life as a, as a, as a kid, as a child, the, the thing that I loved more than anything else was hearing people tell stories. I have loved movies my whole life, still to this day I do. If we have a family night and we all kind of come together to do something, my kids sometimes want to play a game or they want to go somewhere and go, like go bowling or everything that everybody wants to do is some sort of an activity. My idea, 100% of the time, is let's watch a movie. Um, 100% of the time, my boys hate it when I say that because they know that's what's coming because I'm like, it's a family night. Let's watch a movie. Like, let's watch a story. Let's Let's watch somebody who has created the story, tell the story, because that's the most enjoyable thing in the world for me is to watch or hear other people tell stories. And I have loved that my entire life. Um, in fact, when when I was a kid, I, we had different bedrooms and I would be in, in my bed at night, laying in bed. And many nights, Rachel, my sister would come and she would knock on my door and I would tell her to come in and she would come into my room and she would sit at the foot of my bed with her back against the wall and she would lean her head up against the wall and she and I would just sit there. I would lay in bed and she would sit at the foot of my bed and we would just talk. We did this more nights than we didn't do this. In fact, I had, there was a, I'm sure my parents have painted it since then because I still live in that house, but there was a, like a stain on the wall from her, her head leaning against the wall night after night after night. There was just this little dark stain um, from her, head being there. This is when we were little and this went all the way through high school. Like, how are you doing and how I'm doing? And we would talk about our lives and stories and so on. And I, that was, that was my favorite time of the day. I loved those times with Rachel of us just talking. And then when I was in high school, most of the people that I knew were out at parties and they were drinking and doing different things that you do on a weekend. Um, I never liked any of that kind of stuff. I never wanted to be a part of any of that kind of stuff. But my idea, my one of my good friends in high school, his name is Bart Mitchell. He and Bart would spend a lot of time together. And my my idea of of an enjoyable Friday night would be to go to Chili's with Bart and have a conversation. And so, you know, as a as a 16, 17 year old kid, my idea of fun was not bowling and it wasn't activity. It wasn't doing things. It was to sit and have a conversation with a friend and to ask how he was doing and to talk about how I was doing and to tell stories like I've just I've I've loved stories my entire life. And there's this theme this thread that is woven throughout my life. And what I realized over the course of time was that I was actually had a really beautiful gift to do what I do now. And I, and it took me a while to really accept that, to say like, I, I've been given something. I didn't create this within myself, but I have a gift. And I, as I, come into my office day after day and week after week. I spend my entire life now listening to stories, engaging stories, and telling stories. My whole livelihood comes out of listening, engaging, and telling stories. That's what I do with my life. I, I can just tell you when I'm sitting here engaging the heart and the story of another person, I I feel God's pleasure. I said goodbye to a client that I've had for um, about the last two or three years, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And in the work that we've done together, we have deeply engaged his heart and his story. And it was time for him to go. And he left my office for the last time. And I cried during the entire session. I didn't schedule anybody after him that night because I knew I would just need to sit in my office. And I just sat in here and cried because I was so um, 
just so grateful for what had awakened in his life from the work that we had done and the story that he was living with his life. And I was so happy for him and so grateful for the time that I got to be with him. And then also just so sad that like, I, I don't know that I'll ever see him again. And that's what I, I love that. Like, I love that's my, my job is stories. And I think that's what, like, if you look back at when I was a little kid and somebody would say, what do you want to do with your life? And I, if I would have even had the wherewithal to go, I want to listen to stories. You know, it's like that. I mean, you can kind of hear how just kind of ludicrous it sounds like that's not a job. That's not a career. That's great that you love to do that as a hobby, but you, you should go find a real job. And so that's what I think most people spend their entire lives doing. They live a life that is sort of practical. Um, and if that's what you want to do with your life, then more power to you. Like I'm not, I, I don't want to judge that or sit here and go like that's dumb or something like that. But, but what I would say is that I believe that you have a gift and that you're, you begin to discover what you're most deeply gifted at by looking first at the deepest desires that you have and then following those desires, which will lead to your gift, which will ultimately lead to a deep sense of purpose and calling and ultimately a very deep sense of your own identity as a person. Um, <clears throat> What's it, what's interesting about doing these videos is that I'm I'm looking into a camera and really the only feedback that I have at all is the guy sitting on the other side of the camera, Benjamin, and we talk about these. And when I'm looking into this, I don't know who I'm looking at exactly, and I don't know what you're hearing or how you're hearing it. But after the the last video that we did, I was talking with somebody and I got a little bit of feedback. I didn't say this in the video, but, but what the person heard is if you, if you follow your desire, then life is just going to kind of work out for you. I didn't say that. And they said, you didn't actually say that. And I don't know that that's exactly what they heard, but, but kind of like, okay, if I, if I follow my desire, then these are my words. Life is going to kind of be peachy. Uh, it's going to just kind of work out like everything is just going to kind of be handed to you. And and so I think it's important for me to say this. I think that the path that I'm talking about is actually a v probably the most difficult path that you could take. I would never advise somebody just go quit your job and follow your bliss kind of a thing. Like, you know, if you if you if you're an artist and you love to paint, quit your job don't worry about the money and just go paint pictures. And then, and then all the money is going to come rolling in. You'll be able to support your family. I, it does not work like that, that it, I, it doesn't come that easily. So when I say in Proverbs that your gifts will make room for you, I, I believe that that is a process that sometimes takes a significant amount of time. And so even when I was in graduate school, I have never worked so hard in my entire life. I was going to graduate school full time. I was, um, I owned a painting company that I started out there to paint houses, to provide, income to put food on the table for my wife and my boys. In fact, there was one point in time where I had to go three days with one hour of sleep. I took a nap on the second day at like two o'clock in the afternoon because I was working all day and all night just trying to like survive. And so I was writing papers. I was reading books. I was going to classes. It was very common for me to be at a house um, at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, painting walls to make a living to provide for the family. I was, I was tired a lot. Um, but I wanted, I wanted it so badly that I was willing to work as hard as I possibly could to, to go through this program that I wanted to go through because I wanted it so bad. Even like talking about Jerry Seinfeld at the beginning, you know, um, when he would spend 18 months without taking a night off, I'm not advising, like not resting. I'm not advising them, but I'm saying, if you actually listen to what I'm saying, it's going to make your life a lot harder. Like if you want an easy life, if, if what you tell me is at the end of the day, I just want life to be easy, man, just probably just keep doing what you're doing. You know what I mean? Or like, go, I don't know, go find a job that pays you a little bit more. I don't know. I, I don't really know what to tell you. Like, if that's what you want, I'm, I'm not making fun of that. I'm just kind of going like, I, I don't actually believe that's what you really, really want. I think maybe you're disconnected from yourself to think that that's what you want. But it's like, I would never tell you this is easy.
but you love it so much that you don't care. So it is, it is easy and it's really, really hard. There's an ease to it. When you are leaning into your desire and gifts, it's like getting into a river and the river begins to carry you. But finding that river means walking through a lot of woods and getting hit in the face with a lot of branches and bleeding. And I mean, and then even when you're in the river, you're hitting rocks and it's like, there is an ease to it. It's carrying you, but it's also really hard. It'd be a lot, be a lot safer if you just go sit on the shore and watch and don't ever get in the river. In that interview with Jerry Seinfeld, the this guy, Larry Wild, he, he asked him about going to college because Jerry went to college. And Jerry was talking about how like it was really important to him to finish college, like to complete something that he had started. And then Jerry said, if I would have known that I was going to do comedy for a living, I probably would have studied philosophy and history and English. And then Larry said, well, wait, I thought you said that you knew that you wanted to be a comedian when you were eight. And Jerry said, oh, I knew that when I was eight, but I hadn't decided that until after college. And Larry was confused by that. And Jerry said, I, I was petrified about the idea of actually doing this as a career. Like it was terrifying to me. So he had an act. So he knew when he was eight that that's what he wanted to do, but he didn't have the courage to actually do it until much later in life. He hadn't made the decision. I'm going to go do this because it scared him, it scared the hell out of him. I I really I could be wrong about this. Okay, I could be. I think if it doesn't scare the shit out of you, it's not your calling. I think if you're really leaning in to what you're really called to, it will terrify you. You know, I had a professor in grad school tell us, when somebody comes to see you as a therapist, you are their very last resort. They've already talked to their pastor. They've already talked to their friends. They've already, already talked to their spouse. They've already talked to their loved ones to try to figure out what's going on and they can't figure it out. So they're coming to you. And a lot of times it's life or death. It's divorce or a flourishing marriage. It's suicide or living. It's, and you're their last resort. And I remember when they said that, and then I actually became a therapist, I was like, I'm your last resort. <laughs> like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And I'm your last resort. That terrified me. Like, I don't ever want that kind of responsibility. What I do, if I stop and think about it, is really terrifying. <laughs> And I, and I really, I really think if you really are following your path, it'll scare you. I have, I have four boys, three of them drive. If I don't, but if I owned $150,000 McLaren or $150,000 Lamborghini and Jack, my 16 year old, if I had a $150,000 Lamborghini, he's like, Hey dad, can I take the Lamborghini out? I, I think I would want more than anything to be able to throw him the keys to the Lamborghini and to know that he can handle that kind of power and speed. But I, right now, if I had that, I would never give him the keys because he's still sort of learning and kind of proving to me that he can drive without getting in an accident. Like he's learning. Um, and I, I think that as we follow our desire and that leads us to our gifts and then we step into those gifts, the world doesn't just all of a sudden open to you. Um, like you get your driver's license and then God just gives you the keys to the Lamborghini. But it's sort of like, like I think that God wants to know that you are taking your desire and your gifts very seriously. And as you take one step at a time, that it's sort of like, like the universe throws you a couple bucks 
and then you take another step and it gives you a little bit more and it's sort of like waiting to go are you really serious about this are you really serious about taking your life and your desires seriously and then you step into those and more and more and more the universe opens up to you and makes room for you to live out of the fullness of who you are. The power and the gift that you have inside of you isn't going to be fully revealed and handed over to you until you take steps into that direction and show that you're serious about it. And as you do, then you're given more and more and more of what God has wanted to give to you since the time that you were born. Um, all right. So so as, <clears throat> as I close here for today, I, I want to ask you two questions. One of them is, as you look back over the course of your life, can you begin to identify a thread? Like when I was telling the stories about me being so fascinated with story from the time I was a little kid... Can you look back over your life and can you see threads that are woven throughout your life of something that you have always loved and something that has always brought your heart alive? And, and then circling and adding back in the question from the very beginning when I told the story about Eric Little in Chariots of Fire, when he said, when I run, I, I feel God's pleasure. God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Where, where do you feel God's pleasure? Does that, does that question make any sense to you? Um, Eric Little loved to run. He, he had that desire in him from, I imagine... A really early age and he had a gift that made him really good at it and really fast God made me really fast and he loved that and then when he engaged that gift he felt God's pleasure if it was like God was in him and flowing out of him and in and, and even though it was just running Eric Little had a massive impact on people the people around him, the other runners that were trying so hard to win, like that was their entire life was to win. I've got to win this race. I've got to win the Olympics. I've got to be a successful athlete. I don't remember Eric even really ultimately caring that much about winning the Olympics. He just loved to run. And because of that, there was something that was fundamentally different about who he was, how he held himself, how he engaged people. People were drawn to him. He exuded life. He exuded love. He exuded vitality. And he changed people's lives within that sphere of Olympians um, because he was just so different than everybody else because he did it for the love of doing it. Like I, I would even say with my wife, Angie, I remember one time when we lived in Seattle all the boys were in bed and we had all these huge windows in our house. And I went outside and I, I went and walked down the street and I came back one night and I turned around the corner and I saw Angie dancing. She was doing ballet in our living room just all by herself. She wasn't dancing for anybody. She wasn't dancing so anybody could see her. She was dancing because she loved to dance. And I remember turning the corner and seeing her through the windows. And I still remember like my, for a, a moment, my heart literally stopped. And then, and then my eyes flooded with tears because it was so beautiful and, and I know that when she dances, <clears throat> I know that she feels God's pleasure because it just, it fills her heart and it comes out so naturally and she's so free in that space. And that's what Eric Little was talking about when he, when he ran. And that's what I want you to experience in your life is where, where are you overcome with, uh, experiencing the pleasure of God and 
and then you go do that, um, you will you will change people's lives. I promise you that you'll change people. Um, Eric Little changed people. Uh, when I see my wife dance, she changes me, and and I want you to change people because I want you to know who you are and to live out of that and the world will be changed by you if you if you find that follow that <clears throat> there's one there's one tv show that my family watches as a family each week and that's uh the show america's got talent and one of the reasons why i love that is that there are people that come on that show <clears throat> that have uh loved something since they were a little kid and the amount of courage that it takes for them to go on that stage and to sing their song or to do their their you know their 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 magic or to dance their dance uh i'm every time i watch that show i i cry because there are people that are having the courage to step into what they love um and and I'm not asking you to go onto a TV show or anything like that, unless you want to, but like just to take one step into the thing that brings your heart alive and where you feel God's pleasure, um, to take one step in that direction. Um, and I want to say this before we close. Um, I, I can't dance. I, I can't do what Angie does. Um, I run six days a week, but I can't run like Eric Little. There are a lot of things that I can do and that I've worked hard at, but I can never do it in the way that somebody can that has really been gifted. And and to what I what I just want to say is like it, <clears throat> like An Angie, uh, please keep dancing. And <clears throat> to whoever's watching this, whatever you do, that that brings your heart to life. We, we, we need you. The world needs you to, to write your book, to dance your dance, to sing your song, to, uh, to build your business, to, 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 to draw, to paint, to, to teach. Uh, we need you to do what brings your heart alive. And as we, we get to see and experience that, uh, we as a body of people become more whole. And so will you, will you please take this seriously? And um, <clears throat> we, we need you. The world needs you. I need you. Um, I need you to live your life and, and all of mine. Um, and we'll end it there. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.